large entities and, and makes funding available to the domestic violence shelters, uh, along with the executive offices and criminal justice appropriations subcommittee, which is our appropriation subcommittee, uh, put some intent language on their money. And I'm, I'm just gonna read you here quickly um, what that language is. And then I wanted to share with you and go through the report that we produced um, in conjunction with some other entities. And I'll describe that in a minute. But the, um, the language basically said, the legislature intends that the Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice work with relevant state agencies and offices and committee staff and service providers to provide a written report to the Executive Offices and Criminal Justice Appropriation Subcommittee and Social Services Subcommittee by May 27th of 2022, outlining a statewide approach to coordinating funding for victim services, including domestic violence in a statewide targeted fashion, including a description of all agencies and offices involved with domestic violence and the activities they undertake, all, on, all, all ongoing funding by source, allowable use, and any applicable funding formulas, how the state currently assesses needs and demands for services, and identify strategies and recommended next steps to improve statewide coordination. Uh, so that, that came out um, and became effective uh, pretty much at the end of the session and they had a quick turnaround time on it. Um, in a nutshell, what they're really asking for is how are victim services in the state coordinated, funded, and uh, who, who has what responsibilities uh, and those types of things. Uh, it was a really quick turnaround time. We, we had uh, a few meetings with uh, DHS, DCFS, um, Ned Searle with the uh, Utah Domestic and Sexual Violence uh, Program, uh, Tracy Tabbitt with the Children's Justice Centers. Um, we, we listed in the report uh, DWS, Workforce Services. Um, they have a fair amount of TANF money that they make available for DV services and such. But we very quickly you know, pointed out that what was being asked is an enormous task. It's uh, a lot of what um, most of you know, Vicki Bushman that's working on the um, Victim Advocate Liaison Program, which is actually a three-year program um, that is targeted very much kind of in this area. And uh, this is the, the intent language really describes a kind of more of a multi-year project if they wanted to value out of the recommendations. Uh, but they essentially gave us about 90 days to put that together. So what we produced for them really was more of a report that shows the realities of victim services in the state. And the realities of victim services in the state um, are really a funding driven patchwork, as you know, of um, organizations from every level of government, from law enforcement to prosecution to courts to um, private nonprofits within the community. Um, their uh, DPS has recently picked up some advocacy programs. They house the Vine program that's funded largely with VOCA funding. Um, the AG's office has a victim advocate that, uh, that they fund uh, statewide. And so there's, there's just kind of a smattering and has attempted to lay out in this report and in our presentation to both subcommittees on Tuesday or Wednesday of this week, um, that um, conceptually federal grant money is intended to supplement and support uh, 
the financial and and activity commitments from uh, the communities, from local government, and from the state. However, in in Utah, uh, which is not uncommon across the country, most states take the approach of relying primarily upon the federal assistance grants to award out to the organizations and entities who are willing to do the work and submit an application uh, for those funds and get them and, and set them up. Um, what, I, what we really wanted to do here was give the legislature kind of a wake up call that um, they need to step it up and they need to contribute some funding for victim services so that we can actually establish a baseline of funding for victim service organizations and, and providers um, and allow the federal funding to uh, participate as it's intended, as a supplemental. Um, and as I mentioned right now, the federal funding is, is essentially the base. And as you know, uh, that has gone way up since 2015, and uh, it has gone way down in the last year. Uh, so we shouldn't be trying to provide victim services across the state and kind of live or die by federal funding um, policy or, or mentality. Uh, these are things we've been harping on with the legislature for decades. Um, so I was kind of surprised that they, that they actually asked for the report. Um, I don't think they got the report they were anticipating. And um, this, the, the report essentially says, what you've asked for is too big to give to you in the amount of time you've provided. So here is just kind of a very general, uh, very high level overview of how it's laid out. And uh, we're going to continue the process and come back with some far more meaningful recommendations that will be inclusive of uh, victim service providers. Um, we had a little bit of conversation with them about, you know, what is a victim service provider? Well, I can, I can tell you specifically in the mind of the social services appropriation uh, subcommittee, uh, to them, a service provider is one of the domestic violence shelters that they provide state funding to, uh, which is a very narrow view. In our view, victim service providers include everybody from um, funeral directors to locksmiths to victim advocates within the police departments, courts, prosecutors' offices, uh, you name it. If they're providing services to people that have been victimized, they're victim service providers, and it becomes a very large population uh, to deal with and bring to the table. I, I think it's pretty clear that social services has a fairly narrow focus on this uh, in that their, their funding primarily, um, or their, their funding coming through their subcommittee is going almost exclusively to uh, the domestic violence shelters. So uh, we will probably shift our process in the second part for social services to include those provider entities and, and try to encourage them to be a little more specific in their request for information um, to dial it into what it is they actually want to hear. So um, there is some value in this report that I really wanted to share with everybody. Um, and we, we will be uh, reaching out to uh, all of you and, and putting some feelers out there as to who would like to have some input in the second round of this report, even, even if we only share it with uh, executive offices and criminal justice uh, appropriations subcommittee. But it's, it's important for uh, us to keep the legislature apprised of actually the, the, the breadth and the depth and the complexity of victim services um, that uh, certainly includes domestic violence, but isn't defined by domestic violence. And um, so we'll, we'll be reaching out to get some participation in that. Um, 
we've been trying to do a little bit of that through some of you have been uh, participating in the listening sessions that Vicki's been uh, putting together and other efforts that we've been taking. But rather than ramble on, uh, Maddie, if you don't mind throwing that um, back up, we, we, we started with just a, an executive summary to try to give some clarification of what victim services look like, how they're laid out. We identified some key agencies. Now, what, one thing that I did point out here uh, that, I, that I think is important for everybody to know for both subcommittees, um, outside of domestic violence and child abuse, there really is not a state agency um, that is assigned a responsibility for driving victim services across the state. Um, DCFS has a significant uh, series of statutory mandates about providing or contracting to provide domestic violence services. Um, we're going to have some in-depth discussions with them about what that statutory language really means uh, moving forward and, and seeing how we can help them bolster that and, uh, and provide those services. The Children's Justice Centers within the AG's office, they have a, a very specific and significant statutory provision, which I think creates an exceptional model of driving victim services from the community level and, almost, and, and, and in a sense mandating um, a, a team approach as far as funding from the local private level, from the cities, from the counties to the state and rolling in federal money. And, and it is a very good, um, uh, I think, uh, model for that type of service delivery. But when you come to a homicide that's not DV, when you come to DUI, when you come to rape and sexual assault, uh, uh, burglary, aggravated assault, all of those other crime types, there, there really isn't uh, a focused effort across the state. Uh, we have one sentence in our statute. Uh, our statute's very heavy in driving the reparations program at UOVC, uh, but we have one line in our statute that talks about uh, giving the board of directors the authority to make the final approval on the allocation of the federal funding that comes through our office, which as you know, funds uh, the vast majority of victim services in the state. Um, so uh, I'm sorry, I saw a comment pop up there and I got distracted and lost my train of thought. <laughs> bear, bear with me while I get that back. So we started with this executive summary and, and it just tried to create a, a really clear picture for the members of the um, legislative subcommittees of what this looks like. So we identified the, the key state agencies in there. We talked a little bit and gave a few examples of um, the types of nonprofits uh, and non-state organizations that are out there that provide some uh, services uh, just to try to really lay out the, the, the vastness of the victim services universe, um, where I think uh, e even within our own profession, we sometimes get a little siloed and, and focused on our own uh, aspect of, of what we're doing and lose sight of, of how broad and how wide that is. Um, something that, that, that trips us up a lot, I think, um, just looking specifically at um, fiscal year 20 or 21, we had um, 102 homicides across the state. 24 of those were domestic violence related. Um, and you know the, the services that we provide to all of those victims and, and families are equally important, regardless of if it occurred within domestic violence or not. Um, and, and where is all of the focus on those other families that were not DV related? In addition to that, we killed 51 human beings with drunk drivers. 
And where is where is the focus on providing services uh, to those families? That loss is equally significant and no less tragic uh, than domestic violence. And I'm not speaking badly of domestic violence. I'm just saying we have to be careful about pigeonholing our focuses when we start talking about domestic violence um, and giving more emphasis in one area than another. Um, and again, speaking most specifically to the importance of having a, a very widely diversified um, approach to domestic violence. I get the, these initiatives come out of a prior legislative idea that we have one giant agency that serves um, victims. And, and my concern in that is we lose the ability to tap in to the specific areas of expertise and, and the specialization. And, and we kind of create this, you know, all victimization is the same. Well, there is certainly a similarity in, in the trauma. There's certainly a similarity in, in how we can respond but to think that we should be responding to victims of rape and sexual assault in the same manner that we respond to victims of domestic violence or to think that we should be you know, responding to um, a DUI death in the same way we respond to uh, an aggravated assault is, is really naive. So in, in trying to conceive how we organize victim services across the state, keeping in mind that we have agencies like DCFS that specialize in child welfare that are very much and should be very much tied to uh, domestic violence services. Um, and then we have the, um, the, the sexual assault coalition and a very limited number of rape crisis uh, services across the state to focus on those where we, we can bolster those. Then we have the child abuse situations that I think the Children's Justice Center is doing an excellent job of uh, getting involved in the investigation and, and, and in prosecution of those. Um, a, a concept that allows us to have both specializations to get the very specific treatment that victims need regarding their victimization and yet have them coordinated uh, in an effective effort so that, that we can at the same time provide seamless services across the many different facets that we have to cover. Um, and, and I don't wanna take a, a whole lot more time, but I, the, the, this report will be distributed to you. Um, if, you if you'd like a copy of it, I think one of the really good things about the report that I wanna point out is that we each took uh, a section in this where we talked about our own uh, specific programs. Um, let's see, Maddie, I'll see if I can get you a, a page. Well, let me let me back up. Sorry, I'm rambling a little bit. Maddie, if you go to page six of the report, um, we start doing a, 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 well, let's see, is it six or five? Yeah, six. Well, it starts right at the bottom of page five. Um, we're talking about the nearly $12 million that we awarded to just the domestic violence shelters um, in fiscal 22. Uh, we point out to the state appropriators that only $4 million of that was state money. Um, and I wanted to point that out specifically because domestic violence is one crime type state has actually put into statute that the state has an obligation to pay for those services and that DCFS is the agency that has the statutory obligation to either provide or contract to provide those services, yet the state is only contributing one third of the funding for that. And this is a, a really strong opportunity to point out that the state gave itself the obligation to provide the services. They gave a specific agency the obligation to provide the services, but the legislature did not appropriate adequate money to provide the services. And so we have this reliance on 
um, federal money that should not exist. And so I think this is a, this is a really good fight to start um, with them or, or actually to just kind of point out that the responsibility really is theirs uh, to be funding that. Okay, then we'll move on to um, where we had each agency kind of provide the specifics of their report. This report could have been several hundreds of pages long. What we tried to do in providing this electronically is allow the agencies to give a summary, but then link in all of the detail. And um, I just really wanna thank uh, Tally and Dale uh, and Melanie um, with our office and, and their teams for pulling together all of these links to put them all in, in one place. So there's a link in here. If you look up at the top, you've all hopefully seen our website that the, the team has designed. Um, but anything you wanna know about who has applied for Book of Hour or SAS funding is available in these links. Uh, the, the amount recommended by the subject matter experts that review those grants and give us feedback in our screening and allocation processes um, are included in the Boca uh, board report. Uh, that lower, you'll see the VALA SAS board reports. Uh, you can see who got what. Uh, you can see um, you know how much that was for. Um, let's see, Maddie, why, why don't you click on that Boca uh, board report if you don't mind. So from here, you'll see the tabs across the bottom. Uh, the first one's a template. We tried to take that out, but we didn't want to mess up a document that we use. So click to the next one that's the cover sheet. And uh, if, you, if you go to the cover sheet, you can see the funding categories and uh, what their awards were, what their requests are, what the recommendations were, what our office recommended to the board. Um, going on there. And you can see what the actual award was for 29, or 2019 through 21, broken down by funding categories. And then each of the tabs going across will give you more detail on each of those. So there's a, an enormous amount of uh, transparency and information. We wanted to provide this report to the legislature this way so that those who will actually take the time uh, to care and to dive into this, they can have all of the detail they want. Um, and at the same time, we're not uh, providing a, a several hundreds of pages report uh, to a group of folks who may or may not look at it. And, I'm not trying to be cynical. I'm just saying they're, they're very busy and have a lot going on. So we try to keep things as condensed as possible. But this is also a, a great place where you can find an enormous amount of information about um, what's going on with victim services. Uh, then if we go back to the report, um, something else that you can also see and keep tuned in on in this report um, are the links to the statewide victim service provider directory. Uh, that's the, the, I believe the care center uh, it gives you a, a link to the training and, and technical assistance. I have a link in there uh, related to um, the state victim liaison program that Vicki uh, Bushman is heading up. And then multiple other links throughout here, the, the, the needs assessments, uh, the surveys uh, that we, we've had, that we've used federal funds. And again, a lot of emphasis on pointing out to members of the legislature that we're using federal funds to do this. I mean, Vicki's working under a federal grant. Um, you, you may have saw last year House Bill 490 uh, by Representative Ivory and really what that does it, re, it, re, it actually replaced 
this draft of legislation that would have taken a number of um, entities that are providing victim services and put them in one agency um, and assumed that it would have solved the problem instead of making it worse. And so what, what I recommended that Representative Ivory do is basically take the victim services liaison program that Vicki's working under and roll in the statute and place it as a mandate on UOVC to have continued ongoing needs assessments, strategic planning and recommendations made as to how we improve victim services across the state that actually would require us to be in front of the legislature, the governor's office uh, multiple times a year uh, to multiple different uh, appropriation and other committees explaining the complexities of victim services and continually asking for more money based upon data collected through a, a very large group of stakeholders uh, recommendations. And, and so he, he rolled that into some statutory language. It came out too late in the session, but you're going to see that come up again this year. And so uh, from, from our perspective, it makes a whole lot more sense to have this be a continual and ongoing process. We've, we've kind of gotten to where we are in the state with victim services by this kind of patchwork, uh, you know, a fix here, a fix there, uh, you know, a good piece of legislation to do that, a good piece of legislation to do that, a little bit of money here, a little bit of money there. Um, so we're always kind of running around um, like, with uh, we, we've had a leaky roof in the office and Maddie's been running around with uh, trash cans and buckets um, trying to catch the water. And, and that's kind of been our approach to victim services. And that has to stop. We, we have to have a, a continual and ongoing process of review, of input from the stakeholders that we can then roll up to the governor's office, to the legislature, so that uh, we, we eventually land in a spot where uh, we have funding that we can count on, and we have uh, an interested and well-informed legislature about the complexities of these issues. Because right now, I think the majority of them have this notion that uh, we have this very robust and well-funded, massive state agency full of victim advocates. And when somebody is injured um, or victimized in Kanab, Utah, there are five state employees that run to their aid and walk them through the entire process. And uh, that is just um, absolute fantasy and nowhere near reality. And so that's kind of the, the approach we're taking in this. But um, I, will, I will stop now. I won't take up any more of your uh, valuable time. If you have any questions on this, reach out to me. And Maddie, um, Michelle can make that uh, report available. Um, if you have an interest in, in jumping in and getting involved in round two of this process that we're going to continue, whether the legislature asks us to or tells us to or tells us not to, um, uh, we're, we're going to continue the process. So um, if you've got any questions, um, I'll be happy to answer those. Thank you, Gary. Thanks for jumping on and walking us through that. It's nice. It's not often that we get to hear about things before they're in the middle of that pressure of the legislative session. So it's nice to have some of this input ahead. And I'm sure if you need anything, you'll pass it down and we can throw it out through the Swabble listserv. Yeah, I, I welcome that uh, kind of feedback. And I don't know if there were any um, comments that popped up that we need to address uh, while we're here, or if not, I'll... Uh, uh, Laura had Laura Flanagan had mentioned just to make sure human trafficking is included in that as well. Definitely. Hey, great. Well, thank you for your time. Hey, hey thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Hey, thanks. Bye. Bye. Great. We're going to move right into our next presentation.